Online banking. It's so simple. Right from the comfort of your own phone. But don't get too comfortable. Just because it's super convenient doesn't mean that it's safe. In a bank lobby, there's usually a security guard watching over your money. But there's no security guard online. And the days of bank robbers with those masks and guns, they're long gone. Now it's the days of scammers and hackers and data miners. And they're just sitting and waiting to ambush you digitally as soon as you log into your bank account. You've probably used online banking before, and it does seem safe, but it only takes one hacker one time to change all that. So how can you prevent someone from stealing your sensitive information? Well, for starters, you need to be your own security guard. Well, better make that an armed security guard. This is really serious stuff. So for this podcast, I went way outside the box and I found an expert guest, a gentleman by the name of Suraj Ravel. Suraj is a decentralized application developer. He's a guy who builds platforms from the ground up. He's a little younger, he's a little out there. He's one of those genius types who's completely at home both in the physical and the digital world. He's written this book called Decentralized Applications, Harnessing Bitcoin's Blockchain Technology. Perhaps you've heard of the app called Meetup. Our very own Mike James, you know, we always tease him because he's single after all these years. Well, 54 years to be exact, or maybe it's 56, I'm not sure. But he likes to use Meetup to meet his girlfriends. Meetup is just one of the apps that Siraj helped develop, along with a total variety of open source platforms. And get this, aside from everything else, I guess you'd say in his spare time, he's the director of the School of Artificial Intelligence. That's one of the fastest AI communities in the entire world. He actually teaches people how to build their own AI through a course that he calls the Math of Intelligence. It's all about deep mathematical concepts of machine learning. So you can imagine using the words like ambitious, busy, it doesn't really describe him. He's going to be joining us in just a bit, and you don't want to miss it. But how can you outsmart the hackers? How can you protect all of your bank accounts? So if you sign in one day, the balance isn't suddenly like zero. You want to stay with me. I've got the best tips available to date. That's all coming up. But first, a word from our sponsors who make this podcast possible. Okay, we're going to talk about the steps that you need to take to protect your online accounts. I'm going to go through these really quickly because if you're a regular Kim Commando Show listener, you visit commando.com, you may be familiar with all this. But let's start at the tippy top. Number one, use encrypted websites. When you bank online, you want to make sure that the URL address begins with that HTTPS. Do you know what that stands for? A lot of people don't. Okay, so here's what it is. Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. All right, it's kind of like the old HTTP, but it has these superpowers. Those superpowers are encryption. It's like covering your digital track so nobody can follow you into the bank. Nobody can guess your ATM number just by seeing where you punch the numbers. It's kind of like locking all the doors behind you. Encrypted sites convert your online data into this string of unreadable characters so that the intended recipient, in this case, your bank, is the only one who has the key to actually translate it all. So if a hacker tries to steal your data, they're going to have a really tough time because it's encrypted. Now, another way to tell if a website's protected is to look for the padlock symbol at the beginning of the web address bar. If there's an exclamation point or anything else up there, you better examine the site before doing anything. It could be perfectly safe, but your browser isn't as convinced as you are. Speaking of browsers, number two. Try using a more secure web browser when you access your online accounts. Malware bugs have this nasty habit of invading browsers such as Internet Explorer. A lot of people are still using it for some reason because they say, oh, we don't like Edge. And if you're using either one, you might want to check out Google Chrome. It has sort of a watchdog built into it. Another secure browser is Firefox. If you haven't tried that one, you really should. I've used it for so many years. Tip number three is really important. If you're using public Wi-Fi to do anything financially related, a hacker can intercept the data that you send. 
Public Wi-Fi is inherently an unsecure network. Anyone can log in with a password, say from a coffee shop. For the price of a cup of coffee, hackers get the public password and they prey on some poor soul who doesn't know any better. So if you're in a pinch and you have to check your bank account, do yourself a favor. Hook up to your cell phone. That's right. Use your cell phone provider's network. Maybe your cell phone's mobile hotspot with a password that you create. Or better yet, a VPN. If you're not familiar with a VPN, or maybe you think you are, let's go through it just real quickly. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. It's an effective, inexpensive way to conceal your personal data by masking your IP address and your browsing history. The VPN does this by building a kind of so-called private tunnel between you and the server. And through that tunnel is the only place that your data can travel. It never actually touches your home computer. So say you live in Colorado, where it's nice and cool, and you work for a company that's blazing hot in Arizona, and we're not talking just about the temperature. You could probably use that company's VPN. The sensitive data is protected by the company's server, and therefore it won't be lost if you get hacked or your hard drive crashes. It gets kind of techy and complicated, but it's still really cool and user-friendly. Still, if you're on a private network of any kind, it's always best to set up a secure password because you do need that extra safety measure. Another prevention against data loss is something called TFA. Yes, those of us in geekdom and in computer technology, we like to shorten everything up to those three-letter acronyms. TFA stands for, drumroll please, two-factor authentication. That's right. It's also known as multi-factor, so you might have somebody reference that. You probably saw this already. With TFA, you authenticate your identity, not only with your username and password, but another piece of information, like maybe a passcode that the company texts to your phone. And speaking of passwords, how many of you remember this moment on The Simpsons, where a student hacks into the school's computer system and totally crashes it? You're not supposed to be able to get outside our network. You shouldn't have made your password password. What was the name of the street I grew up on? Password Drive. Okay, I was just trying to lighten things up. But people make a lot of mistakes when it comes to setting passwords. Mistakes cost them millions of dollars sometimes. So if you've got this super old password that you set back in the day, you want to change it. What was considered a strong password 5, 7, 10 years ago is probably medium strength or even weak by today's standards. My guest in this podcast, Siraj, wanted to comment on this. So let me bring him in right now on the podcast. Hey, Siraj, thanks for being on the podcast. Glad to be here. Okay, you were really bent on passing along some password tips. So what's your password tip? My first tip is to not have the same password for all of the accounts that you use. If one of them gets compromised, all of your social media is compromised. So um, I would have a separate password for all of your accounts. Um, I would save all of that in one kind of file that is itself password encrypted. Uh, You're not storing that locally anywhere on your laptop or desktop. You're storing that in the cloud. So maybe in your, your Google Drive account or your... AWS account, but it it itself is password encrypted, but the cloud is safe if you've encrypted whatever you're uploading to the cloud. So that way, even if that file is compromised, you still have the password to whatever you've uploaded to the cloud. All right, it's probably time to update your passwords. Now, another type of multi-factor authentication is the fingerprint question. Your mother's maiden name, the name of your first pet. Which of these addresses is most familiar to you? I'm sure you've seen these before. Multi-factor is just one more layer of protection that hackers have to penetrate in order to get to your cash. If your bank requires one, that's a great thing. Two is even better. But companies like Apple are taking fingerprint security one huge step further. So what do you think about that, Suraj? The whole field of bioinformatics deals with using biometric markers like your fingerprint, your iris, your, in some cases, even DNA, as a way to authenticate you to whatever account you're trying to use. Right now, Apple has been one of the biggest companies that's, that's adopted this biometric scan for your fingerprint via the iPhone. 
Um, but I think that is definitely a good thing. Um, I'd like to see more of that. And I think in the future, we're going to start moving towards iris scanning um, and then eventually some sort of a blood pressure scanning, which, where it like measures the cadence of your blood pressure via just like a simple non-invasive touch with your thumb. And that would provide unique authentication as well. But overall, it's a good thing. Our next tip is a pretty much standard feature in banking. I'm talking about the alert system. Banks are totally willing to send you a warning any single time there's a suspicious activity on your account. You can usually set your own level of suspicion and your bank will alert you. I know sometimes these alerts, it just feels like noise, it's clutter, and you may be tempted to ignore them. But just glance over them before you actually trash them. Remember, it only takes one small fraudulent transaction to open the floodgates. And let me tell you how. Stefanina Foreman is a financial specialist with the U.S. Navy. She told us how a $1 charge can allow an online thief to go on a major shopping spree at your expense. The new thing with the hackers is when they scam your information, they'll send a charge through for under a dollar. A lot of people may see that on their statement and just disregard it or blow it off. What happens is once that charge goes through, it tells them that the account is open and active, and then they begin to make other purchases, large dollar amount purchases. Now, there are some people who never worry about a breach. They figure, hey, I'll get an alert if there's this weird activity on my account. Then there are those who check their balance every single day. Nothing gets by them. If a sneaky little unexplained dollar or $3 bank charge pops up, they're going to see it. Now, in reality, we're all busy. So at least once a week, just check your statements. And using your own two eyes is still the best way to check for any fraudulent transactions on your accounts. Now, some of you have moved from cards and banks to Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other forms of cryptocurrency. I actually wrote a book about this. You can find it over at shop.commando.com if you're interested. But let's talk to Siraj again. Siraj, do you really think that Bitcoin is, I guess you'd say, safe? Right now, I wouldn't call blockchain technology safe. I wouldn't use the word safe to describe it. I would use the word volatile, high-risk investment. I use the phrase, the ability to have a bank account if you cannot have a bank account otherwise. That's that, that's what's given to you, right? So I'm talking about these developed countries like you know Kenya, developing countries like Kenya and India. If, if you don't feel like you can trust your local bank authorities with your money, Bitcoin allows you to open a bank account in a way that doesn't require a bunch of paperwork. You know, you just open a bank account and it's on your phone. So in terms of safe, it's safer than a corrupt bank, but it is not safer than, say, a very well-established bank like J.P. Morgan Chase or ING, etc. But yeah, security as a service is something that a bank provides. And right now, the closest thing that the blockchain world has to that is Coinbase.com. I also checked in with a world-renowned technologist and one of the most respected experts in Bitcoin. Coming up, we're going to tell you what to watch out for and how to stay protected. Andreas has founded a number of Bitcoin businesses, and he launched several community open source projects. He has his own podcast. It's called Let's Talk Bitcoin, as you might expect. He's got a couple of books, Mastering Bitcoin, The Internet of Money. He was actually a guest on one of my Bitcoin podcasts before. So, Andreas, explain how you use cryptocurrency in a transaction. Since 2013, the maximum amount of time I have left currency, crypto or fiat, on an exchange is 15 minutes. I transact weekly, sometimes more often. Uh, I use these currencies to pay my bills, to live. And so I have to transact, and I often have to exchange, because I can't always buy the things I want with cryptocurrencies. And how do you exchange it? A lot of people wonder about that. How do I exchange? In and out. In, three confirmations, sell, ACH, or bank transfer, out. I don't even leave fiat on exchanges. I don't trust them to hold money. 
I don't trust banks to hold money. How am I going to trust a two-year-old startup that has six employees? So I don't leave money on exchanges. Now that's difficult to do if you're day trading, and if you're day trading in this environment with these assets of great volatility, I mean, you're a brave person. That's great, Andreas. Just one last question: How do you store your Bitcoin? Think of it as warm or hot to cold, all the way down to deep freeze. On the cold side, I have a small amount of Bitcoin that I hold in deep cold storage. That means that they're held on keys that are not instantiated on any device, that exist in such a way that they're encrypted with a memorized passphrase, which I have also communicated to people who might become my heirs, so that they don't get lost with me. And that's cold storage. Then I have an intermediate tier, which is on a hardware wallet. Actually, several hardware wallets. Again, pin protected, passphrase protected, backed up with mnemonic phrases. And then I go to the warm tier. Right? I have a small amount of operating cash that I use for my businesses to pay subcontractors, etc., etc. Those are in multi-signature or multi-signature, multi-factor wallets. In which case, I'm the only party. But I have several devices that need to sign independently in order to exercise a transaction. And finally, I have my hot hot wallet, which is in my back pocket and is at the moment mycelium. And I never keep on my hot wallet more than I'm comfortable keeping in cash in my physical wallet as fiat. What Siraj and Andreas said really sticks in my head. We're talking about Bitcoin, blockchain. The environment is not completely safe. It's not backed by any government or any bank. It's very, very volatile. It comes with risk, which leads us back to this whole open source platforms. Siraj's area of expertise is this, and it's really important for you to know some things about this. Open source software, in case you've never heard before, it has source code, which has been made available to the public, so anyone can inspect it, modify it, enhance it. Uh, Bitcoin, some people say, is truly open source because it was also designed by the public. Nobody owns or controls Bitcoin. Everyone can take part in the development. Bitcoin operates on peer-to-peer technology. There's no central authority, as I mentioned, and there is no bank. The only entity managing transactions and issuing Bitcoins is the network itself. There are a lot of positive aspects to open source because you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. You get input on security. You have developers, students, and programmers all contributing. They like to call it something called the open source way. It's kind of a code of ethics. It's, I guess, should say, a lifestyle. The open source way is this willingness to share, to collaborate with others in ways that are transparent. There are no clicks. It's a willingness to embrace all failure as a means of improving the world. Maybe you've used Mozilla, Apache, or Linux. Those are all examples of open source platforms. Some people claim open source is more stable and more secure than, say, privately run platforms. But again, it's totally up to you. You have to choose which system seems most secure and comfortable to you. Speaking of comfort zones, did you know that you can now send money to anyone instantly from the comfort of your own phone? There's a lot of apps out there. They have names like Venmo, PayPal, Zelle. They make it easy to move money around. Even Facebook Messenger can be a vehicle for transferring dollars to one of your contacts. Google Wallet will let you send funds with just an email address. The recipient just enters his or her account number, and then the money flies in like magic. But again, is it safe? Well, check it out. Use the checklist in this podcast. Is there an HTTPS in the browser bar? What about a padlock? Is it a known trusted company? Did you use a password to get in? Are you on a private network? Don't use public Wi-Fi for this stuff, folks. Be on guard. Watch your accounts. Check for double charges, and don't forget to sign up any alerts. So there it is. A really quick rundown on how to upgrade your online banking safety habits. Don't put this off. Share this podcast so that everybody knows. And I want to thank Siraj Ravel for being my guest. You can find him on YouTube and LinkedIn. And also thanks for Stephanie Foreman and Andreas Antonopoulos for your great advice. And by the way, if you didn't fully understand everything that I covered today, because you do have to go pretty quickly in a podcast, just dig around my website, commando.com. I've got literally a university full of articles and podcasts about internet safety. 
because I really don't want to see you get ripped off. I don't want the hackers and scammers to win. So take advantage of everything I've got over at commando.com. I'm Kim Commando. Thanks for joining me on this Commando On Demand podcast. And if you learned just one thing, do me a huge favor. Give us a great five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you can write a few nice words like, thank you, Kim Commando, for making my life better, that would be pretty awesome. And thanks.